my love for computer science started in the late 60s in high school. That was when I was introduced to binary by my math teacher. Ever since then, I have been fascinated by what we can do with zeros and ones. I was fortunate to have found my passion that early and also my future profession, even though it was years later when I moved to the UK that I saw my first computer in the early 70s. The picture I'm showing you up there was taken in 1967. I was 14 years old. I was presenting a binary calculator that was made out of wood and wire and 3D graphical shapes you see in the circle in a science exhibition at school. And that's my math teacher on the side. I tell you, the, the feeling and passion and excitement I felt building these objects has remained with me with every technology project I have built since then, including the one I'm going to be talking to you about today. Now, in my working life, there was never a dull moment. Every day was different, and every year was different. I worked with tools that are constantly changing to solve problems that are constantly changing. It was a lot of excitement. In the last decade or so, I decided to focus my science work on disruptive technology projects. So I took interest in quite a, quite a number of the new age technologies that were coming about and started to work on them. And the project that I'm going to be talking to you about now is probably the most exciting I have ever worked on. And it's to do with media and live events. So, what is the problem we're trying to solve? If you think 99% of all fans, or more, will never get a chance to see the heroes or attend a live event, and the reasons are many. Logistical reasons, travel, cost, etc. Even when they do, most fans will never get the best seats in the arena. The good seats are often reserved for VIP and corporate clients. So it was against this background. Back in 2008, I was working on a project to provide capacity for the Principality of Monaco. And it's a, it was a virtual tourism project. We presented the design and the model in Monaco. And we were creating a metaverse Monaco. Remember, that was back in 2008. Virtual tourism was not yet being mentioned. And everybody liked it uh, when we presented it in Monaco, including Prince Albert, who attended. The problem we faced, the crash of 2008, prevented us from taking the project forward and raised the funding we needed. Also, for VC, virtual tourism then was not a great idea. So I came back disappointed in not being able to take it forward. And I was sitting, having a good old chat with a very good friend and a colleague of mine, Jesus Hormigo. And we were talking about this very issue, mobility and technology. And we came up with a really crazy idea. And the crazy idea is that we wanted to bring fans the live event to them instead of them going to the, to the event. Any live event, not just a live event. So we talked about it for hours. Second day, the same. Weeks later, we're still talking about it, and it still made sense. I thought, let's give it a shot. <laughs> so uh, I looked at the resources we needed and prepared ourselves and looked, forward, looked, looked for some funding that we needed. And two of my good friends, a businessman and a tech and media entrepreneur, when I presented them with this model, they really loved it, and they gave us a go ahead to start the work. So it was great to see this project started to move forward. What is the idea? We wanted, in a nutshell, to take 
all the active elements of an event that is taking place and transpose it in real time to a, a platform whereby people can step in and feel the sense of presence in that event. So we wanted to capture all the telemetry and motion of an event that is taking place and place it in a virtual simulator and then bring the fans in to experience it. So we started the project very, very excited and very soon we hit a few obstacles. First of all, the trackers were the size of a brick. I couldn't find a tracker on Google, so I found a brick from back then. So they were, they were used for cows and horses, and we couldn't uh, get any, uh, any sensible trackers to work with. Equally, the graphic cards at that time were quite uh, not as powerful as today, and neither was the networks that we needed to bring all that data and get it all working. We were uh, uh, facing challenges right, left, and center. But what, what we did, we decided to tackle the things we can do and leave the things we cannot do. We split the tasks. Jesus continued working on the design. And I decided to take myself and learn some brain science, given the fact that we are trying to bring in a new experience and a, and a, and a greater feeling of presence. So I turned to brain science, and I joined a brilliant team led by Professor Chris Tumazu at Imperial College where I learned about brain-computer interfaces and neuroscience. It was an amazing experience. At the same time, I was working with Professor Olaf Blanke on a brilliant project that he created, which is a reality substitution machine. And the idea is where you can, we can uh, uh, create uh, an environment to replace your existing reality with full embodiment. So, we worked with Olaf on this project. It was very exciting. Uh, we built the machine. In fact, it received a lot of media coverage here in Switzerland. And uh, it was presented uh, to President uh, Francois Hollande uh, during his official visit to Switzerland a few years ago. We were very happy with that outcome. We learned a lot from it. But also, as a spin-off from this work, we created a new project, which is the Dream Machine. It's being demoed on the third floor for mindfulness training and uh, uh, relaxation. So all that experience we gained from brain science, we took it back, put it into this idea that we're building that we named Virtually Life. So Virtually Life we saw as a new media that sits between attending a live event and watching it on television. And that media rel relies on telemetry and tracking data as its main source of input. Again, just to put you in the spirit of what we are trying to do, we take uh, an environment and we simulate it. We track all the motion in that environment. Then, because of all the data errors and data losses that you get from the various transmissions, we have to write predictive and, uh, and the corrective logics to fix that data and synchronize it so it all flows. And incidentally, the data we're talking about including weather. So it's not only what, what is happening in that venue or that arena, but also the external environment. Then we transpose it and we make it available for an immersive experience. And not only that, we want to allow the, uh, uh, the fan to step in and have their friends. So somebody could be in Switzerland, another one could be in New York, they could be together in a, in a new proximity. All that work was on the design. We couldn't take it to test because some of the technologies, we built some of the technologies ourselves, but some of the other technologies was too much for us to do with the resources we had. So, but what we did, we continued to build our architecture and build simulators and models in our lab. We built a football simulator, we built a, a motorsport simulator, and other entertainment and education simulator. Fortunately, in the last few years, technology and VR has taken off. Many of the elements that we needed have started to become available. Tracking was the biggest. If you think back, everyone, is, every one of us is tracked now with our mobile devices. The Internet of Things, tracking is so easy and so transparent. So that was great for us. And everything else, cloud computing, virtual reality headsets, started to all come together. And suddenly, we found ourselves in a situation where 
hey, we've got, <laughs> we've got everything ready, the technologies are there, our design is ready, let's give it a go. So we needed a partner to work with, and we partnered with, with Formula E, because we saw as the, that they are the, the best entry partner for us, so, so we can learn from the experience and we can run some joint trials with them. We had some amazing trials that have been taking place for the last year with Formula E, where we have captured the whole race live, placed it in a new uh, uh, simulator, and allowed people to step in with their friends and see the race from any point of view. They can even join the car. So we built that, and I'm proud to show you today uh, a small video clip that, courtesy of motorsport.com, on the latest uh, race that Formula E did at, at, in New York. Hi, I'm Julia Piquet, and welcome to Motorsport Report. In this edition, we explore Formula E in virtual reality. All right, so you're now in the New York City e pre E-Motion Club. So pull the trigger and point at the floor, and you'll see a V logo. Yeah. When you see that logo, let go, and you're going to jump to that spot. Oh. That Looking through the goggles, I could see a 360-degree representation of the New York City e pre I could watch the live practice in real time from any corner on the track. And this is them racing live right this now? This is them racing live, yeah. That is so cool. If watching a race in virtual reality from any corner wasn't good enough, with the click of the trigger, I was transported into the cockpit of Nelson Piquet Jr.'s Formula E car. And I'm going to lower you down just a slight bit. <laughs> so you can get a really immersive perspective of what it's like to sit in the cockpit. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> okay, enough of this ride along. I wanted to drive. You're going to pretend like you have a driver's steering wheel in your hand. Okay. Um, holding the controller's level. And when you want to turn the wheels right, you simply turn the wheels right. So there I was, on the track, virtually, at a Formula E race. This is a hairpin turn, so make sure you brake. That was actually great. Well done. The new technology is intended to supplement the viewing experience for each race event in Formula E. You will also be able to explore the track live or watch the race later. Brake hard, lock up. You're actually really good. You're really good for the first time trying this. <laughs> Virtually Live debuted its technology live on Facebook and Periscope earlier this year. The company hopes to get the passion and excitement of the series to a new generation of potential electric racing fans. That's it for today's Motorsport Report. I'm Julia Piquet, and thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you so much. I tell you, it was great to see it working. What we're doing now, we're working on the Motorsport platform, and we continue to make the enhancements we need, but also we're working on other sport and entertainment experience, so stay tuned. There's one confusion now with VR coming up, which is uh, a lot of people confuse using VR with 360 video. 360 video is 360 video. It's not true virtual reality. Virtual live media is true virtual reality, where you can step in and, and, and move about. You are not stuck to one position, as, as is the case. A friend of mine described it well, Bruno, and he said, it's, it's the difference between being in the fish tank or watching it. And with virtual life, you're in that experience. You are immersed in it, and there's a great sense of presence, and you get the feeling of being there. My message here is, if you believe in something, it doesn't matter if other people think you're crazy, don't give up. So, Thank you very much.